Thank you um, very much for inviting me here today. I'm really delighted to be here, and I think it's fantastic turnout for the Friday before Christmas, so um, thanks very much for all coming. Um, I've got, uh, again, quite a challenge really here today, it's just 15 minutes to talk about communication, and I'm certainly not going to teach any of you to suck eggs because you wouldn't certainly be in the jobs that you are now without having um, plenty of communication skills and training and, and a background. So what I really would like to do today is make this a very practical session and really leave you with some key questions to think about yourselves but also to take back to your colleagues and I think one of the um, outcomes of today hopefully is to prove just how easy it is really to get quite a lot of information out um, from such a short time from 15 minutes um, investing time to discuss these issues with your colleagues could hopefully um, be well worth it. So there is a bit of a danger giving me a microphone and putting up this slide that I'm going to start singing, but I am going to sort of uh, uh, pull myself back from that. But I think one of the, the most important messages really to take away is to ask yourself, how often do you check in to make sure that your messages are received and understood? And I certainly do quite a lot of complaints adjudication and looking at um, various record keeping. And certainly I think one of the, the key things that I um, think about is, is looking to see whether or not the messages people are being given have been taken on board. And quite often, staff will say to me things like, well, of course we told um, the patient X, Y, and Z, but that's certainly not the message that the person has um, received. So we'll be talking a little bit about that um, in more detail. And just really, again, to start with the definition, effective nursing community communication has been described as getting the right information in the right format at the right time in the right location all in a way that is understandable and again what I'd like to touch on a little bit later as we move through the session is thinking about some of the offensive and meaningless phrases that we might come across not just in verbal communication but also um, in what's written and what's actually um, produced in, in emails and all sorts of different uh, written formats. So, as I say, the first um, challenge really to you is to ask yourself, how are your messages being received and understood? I'm sure many of you are very familiar with this um, particular concept and the fact that actually, um, you know, it's about 93% of our communication that is um, non-verbal in our sort of daily work. And again, thinking about the gestures that we use, the body language, the things that maybe are mis misinterpreted, that are open to uh, misinterpretation. And again, thinking about the intent, what we started off intending to do in our communication and how that actually ends up in the, the final um, phase, if you like. The actual number really isn't important, but it is important to think about and be self-aware of our um, body language, of our gestures, and again, you know, obviously different cultural um, influences there, but certainly thinking about how we're coming across. And I read a really sad letter in our local paper recently, which said that somebody had been in hospital for several weeks, and, and they'd, it was actually written by the visitor, and they said in the whole time that they were visiting, they didn't see one nurse smile. Now, I think that's really sad. And, you know, are we really having to say to people it would be nice to um, put a smile on your face? And again, thinking about the microphone and the singing, another little song that sort of comes into my mind is that one about you're never fully dressed without a smile and how, you know, it's what you wear from ear to ear that's, that's important. And obviously we need our smiles to be sincere, we need them to have some meaning, um, but I, I do think, you know, it doesn't hurt really to um, think about those real core um, basics. So just to, before I move on, just thinking about some questions for you and for you to take back to your colleagues. And I think picking up just on Clive's point about who inspires you, one helpful sort of starting point for this is thinking about who do you think is a good communicator? Who is it that you've either worked with or you, you know that is a really good communicator and why are they a good communicator? What does that look like? So what does good communication look like? And what are the most important behaviours and skills that nurses need? And again, we can look theoretically at the standards for pre-reg nursing education from the NMC. We can see what is expected of a nurse at the point of registration. But again, it's about how does that actually um, translate into practice? 
So again, thinking about um, various aspects, thinking about what gets in the way of good communication. Why does it become so difficult? Because everybody, again, starts off in their career thinking about the fact that they want to communicate well, that they want to help people. No, none of us, no healthcare professional gets up in the morning and thinks, right, what can I do um, to cause a problem today? What can I do to be grumpy? It is all about you know, thinking about what are those barriers and how are we going to manage them? What needs to change, even if there's just one thing? <coughs> And how and will how sorry, how and when are you personally going to make that happen? Not say, you know, I've reported it to my managers, it's up to them, but what are, what's our own single personal responsibility and accountability? And again, it's coming back to some of the rudiments in the code, coming back to the guidelines for records and record keeping, which I will touch on shortly. And I think a very useful question for all of us is do I prefer to talk or listen? And the other speakers have alluded to the importance of listening, and again, we all know that that's a very effective way of gathering information. But are we actually listening? We might be hearing, are we listening? And what makes me interrupt when somebody else is talking? And personally, I've actually spent three months as a hospital visitor this year, and I've certainly seen things from a very different um, perspective. And I didn't feel listened to on many occasions, um, and I'm not going to go into the details of that, but I think, again, it was a very salutary lesson, and it's about feeling interrupted. And I like to think that I'm somebody that's fairly articulate, fairly assertive, uh, no, you know, obviously the healthcare system, I've worked in it for over 30 years, but even I found it really difficult and challenging to actually get my point across and be listened to. So again, ask yourself with communication, was that really the best way, the best method that I could use? Why am I sending an email to my next door neighbor in the office? Why am I not picking up the phone? Why am I not going for a face-to-face? -face? Um, you know, and again, the actual information that gets translated, I've spent a lot of time investigating complaints. I look at complaints letters. I see people asking very clear questions that simply haven't been answered right from the outset. And then it obviously um, cascades. Having said that, I should say I also have seen some excellent responses and some excellent um, practice as well. Another question I think is really important is obviously to think about whether communication actually matched the purpose of what we set out to do in the first place. And also asking yourself regularly, what did I mean when I said? And also having the courage to ask that question of your colleagues. What did you mean when you said X? What did you mean when you wrote X? because we perhaps don't do that often enough and it shouldn't get to the third stage of the complaint or the, um, you know, so, some sort of um, audit, you know, it shouldn't get to the day of the CQC visit before somebody is challenging the documentation and I'll come back to that in a little while. Again, ask yourself, how clear have I been? Did I use plain English? Have I avoided jargon? And I was actually involved in investigating a very complicated complaint earlier th in the year, which consisted of 190 documents. Um, and I, the, all, sort of practically every page, the, the abbreviation PT appeared. And I had been reading this and assuming wrongly that that meant patient. And then I went back to check the meaning of that abbreviation. It was actually physiotherapist. Could have been prothrombin time. I mean, there's lots of things that PT could stand for. So again, it's, it's asking yourself and others, what do you actually mean? Plain English, again, you know, write what you mean um, and mean what you write. Say what you mean, mean what you say. And again, coming back to that ground control to Major Tom, to what extent has your message really been received and understood? And how do you know that? What measures, what checks and balances have you got to actually um, monitor all of that? And constantly asking yourself, what could I do differently next time? However long you've been in your particular role, however experienced you are, there's always that opportunity to think about, you know, maybe I could have tackled that differently. And it's, you've got to, again, own the communication and, and treat this from a very personal, accountable um, stance. 
I'd imagine some of you may feel like this on some occasions. We talk about the paperless office. I believe we're probably quite a long way off from that. And again, I spend a lot of time, part of my role at the moment is as a CQC inspector, and I spend a lot of time looking at lots and lots and lots of documentation and asking stuff, you know, what's the purpose of that particular document? There's, there, as well as not writing enough sometimes, I think there's a danger of actually duplication, and I find, you know, the same information in different places. Again, you know, there's obviously a risk then that there might be inconsistent information, but we need to be really clear about if we are generating generating a document, what is the purpose, and again, what does it actually look like in terms of the quality, not just of the content, but actually um, where it's being used and how it's actually being communicated. We've mentioned a few significant reports this morning, and again, whether or not you work in the National Health Service, you know, you. It, if you're working in the independent sector, there are some really key lessons to be taken out of this report, which was the review of the NHS um, hospitals complaint system that came out in October. And you may well recall that at that time, many of the um, headlines actually were saying things like, it's, it's time that we gave everybody in hospital a piece of paper and a pen in order to um, note down their complaints and I think that's a little bit sad I think you know yes give people pieces of paper and pens by all means to document their complaints but let's get them to uh, document their successes and their comments and their positive outcomes as well and in fact again that's one thing if you read through the report uh, the Cluid and Hart report there is a lot in there about celebrating success there are some case studies of good examples about managing complaints as well as the less um, favorable so I would urge you to pick that report up and read it and, and actually think about what it means to you and your organization um, because there's some very rich qualitative uh, data in there, some really personal um, accounts. As you're probably aware, Anne Cluid um, led this and she is an MP who actually spoke from very personal experience in terms of the way she was treated or felt treated as a relative and Professor Trisha Hart is um, a former nurse. Just picked out a couple of headlines from that report. Again, I think probably something that we could maybe identify with, as I say, regardless of the sector that you're working in, uh, just thinking about could this possibly be said of your organisation or any other organisation. And certainly, again, those of you who have been patients, those of you who are relatives of patients, again, may be able to identify with this business of actually having to keep repeating the same answer to the same question. Again, it's asking ourselves, what do we mean by managing and talking about effective communication in a friendly or concerned way? What does that look like? How do we actually demonstrate to people that we care? And again, hopefully that we're not, we're, we're nipping things in the bud and not waiting until um, it's reached quite a high level. So I'm just sort of going to, to round off um, in a little while with some of the musts for nurses. And these are musts in the fact that these are actually excerpts from the code. These aren't shoulds, coulds, you might if you like. These are musts for every registered nurse and midwife, regardless of sector, regardless of job. Um, so again, it's not a choice. We know these things. Um, and I think Particularly, again, it's thinking about having another look at the code and what it means to you today and tomorrow and not the day you qualified, but actually thinking about the practical application now. And it's being able to demonstrate that you've responded to those concerns and preferences. And again, thinking about the arrangements we need to make to, to manage people's communication needs when, for example, English might not be their first language, when they might have um, particular uh, special needs that you need to make um, particular arrangements for. And how do you know that you've presented that information in a way that people can understand and that you know, you've given and hit them sort of at the right level in terms of what they actually want to know about their health?
keeping colleagues informed, I was speaking to a care assistant the other day and she said that she'd just come back from two days off. She had actually been looking after somebody for several years in a care home and nobody had thought to tell her that that person had died while she'd been off. You know, and she was genuinely you know, extremely distressed and sort of had, hadn't had a proper handover and came across this sort of as a kind of, oh, well, by the way. Well, you know, that's, that's actually a fairly um, important piece of information to share with people. Uh, and again, I think we can probably go give good and bad examples of how we do share um, the care and the care information. And I think this is, a, again, this other clause here, 42, it's a big reminder that it's not just about the care that you've, you've given, but how good are we at capturing the discussions, the assessments, um, and as I say, the discussions, it may not just be discussions with people in your care, but it's the discussions with colleagues. And going back again to another practical example of a complaint I looked at earlier in the year, um, the um, person concerned had actually been in hospital for four months, and a lot of the complaint related to a lack of communication between the nurses and the doctors. And when I looked through those 190 documents, I couldn't find one record that actually demonstrated they'd been speaking to each other and that they, they had spoken to each other with the person concerned. So it's not to say it didn't necessarily happen, but I couldn't find the evidence. We're also reminded of what to avoid. And again, you, you need to obviously look through the detail of things like um, obviously the guidance for records and record keeping from the NMC, but also the CQC outcomes. And think about what do we mean by offensive and meaningless language and gestures. And for example, I've seen the word obnoxious used quite recently in somebody's records. I've seen words like demanding, difficult, agitated, confused, pleasant. So it doesn't need to be offensive. My husband has actually um, had a, a number of um, letters between the consultant and GP this year, and it always starts off describing him as a pleasant gentleman. And I probably think that's because he hasn't asked any awkward questions. He's been very compliant, done what he's told, um, hasn't taken his stroppy nurse wife along with him to any of the consultations. Um, but, you know, in all seriousness, you know, who, what does, that, what does that mean to describe somebody as pleasant? And equally, would, would the same person have written that he was unpleasant if that's what they thought? I've seen people described as incontinent. When they're not incontinent, they simply had to use a bottle for the first time in their lives and spilt the bottle and therefore they've then been labelled incontinent. So we need to think about, um, again, meaningless statements as well. What does it mean when you say plus, plus, plus? Plenty, frequent, regular, appropriate, inappropriate, good, bad, um, all those sorts of words. And I quite often do this as an exercise with staff and get them just to think about what terms might be either offensive or meaningless. Things like, again, in statements, what does it mean when somebody's writing, I thought, I felt, I assumed, it appeared. So just, again, that can be a 10, 15 minute exercise with colleagues just to think about eradicating some of the offensive and meaningless language that we use. In terms of endearment, again, I don't think anybody intends to offend, but to sit and listen um, to people being called sweetie, lovey, dear, darling, all those sorts of things. Unfortunately, I think it's still happening. And as I say, it's just about holding ourselves back and about how that message is being received and understood. Again, avoiding opinion, abbreviations, jargon, irrelevant speculation. Stick to the facts. That's what's important. And obviously, um, while we're talking about communication, being very clear about the regulations that are in about not destroying or altering records. So I think it's quite appropriate today when we're talking about the six C's, when we're thinking about compassion, um, thinking about Mother Teresa, you know, well famous for her compassion. And we can spend a long time looking back on all, oh, you know, the good old days or the bad old days or however we perceive them. But we've got to think about what does all of this mean today and tomorrow, move this forward in a very positive way. We're in charge of this, as we've heard, we can have the opportunity to take these things forward. And I do think it's, it's important after today to think about how we actually um, put some of this into practice, how we make a difference. 
So thank you all very much for listening, and I hope you all have a very good break if you've got one, and if not, um, enjoy your work. Thank you very much.